here in rural South Vietnam that America and her allies met their darkest hour. This tropical land of rice paddies, small villages, and peasant farmers soon turned into a living hell for the GIs as they tried to wage war against a dedicated and determined enemy. To combat America's superior firepower and complete control of the air, the Viet Cong adopted a brilliant strategy. At the heart of their resistance, a deadly spider's web of fiercely defended tunnels and subterranean bunkers under the rice fields and jungles of South Vietnam. The communist fighters literally lived, ate, and slept under the battlefield. They had hospitals, classrooms, and armament workshops. From these fortified nests, the guerrillas sprung their deadly ambushes. But a courageous few American and Australian foot soldiers, the Tunnel Rats, dared to staunch the enemy tide. It was their terrifying task to chase the enemy down into their booby-trapped retreat. And you get down in a tunnel and they start closing in on you or you hear noises and you start shooting and you can get cranked up real easy and lose it completely and, and uh, probably make you go insane if you're not careful. When you uh, expanded your lungs, when you took a breath, you were kind of wedged in. Now, if you can picture yourself being stuck, if there was a cave-in or something, I, I can't imagine a worse way to die. The tunnel rats would soon distinguish themselves for their uncommon valor and selfless commitment to duty. You took pride in what you did. There wasn't very many of us. But if you did it well, you know you did something worthwhile. Because whatever you unearthed, whatever you uncovered, whether it be intelligence, maps, we get the edge on the enemy. The most dangerous part would be psyching up to get into the tunnel. That was the part that was really the most frightening because you didn't know what you were getting into. When the U.S. and Allied troops first arrived in Vietnam in the early 1960s, they had no idea that the enemy were under their very feet. On the surface, the tunnel entrances were carefully camouflaged. VC guerrillas appeared and disappeared down them at will. They were so well concealed. I mean, we probably walked over thousands of them, never knew it. Uh, especially in the Coochie area, that's, that's where the, uh, the majority of all the tunnels were. The small town of Coochie, just 50 miles north of Saigon, was at the heart of the Viet Cong's secret network. By 1965, the system snaked nearly 200 miles under villages, huts, and fields. It weaved from the Ho Chi Minh Trail in the north to the gates of Saigon in the south. Under the battlefield was a system of tunnels connecting communities from village to village. This was not the first time tunnels have been used in war. In fact, tunnels and underground fortifications had been used for thousands of years. Among the first troops with a specific mission to search and destroy the enemy's underground bunkers were British sappers in World War I, and most famously, the U.S. Marines in World War II. As early as 1943, the Japanese dug confounding subterranean defenses on the coral atolls of the Central Pacific. Penetrating the caves and hidden bunkers on the many islands like Saipan, Peleliu, Iwo Jima, and Okinawa became a challenging and dangerous task for these first U.S. troops to be called tunnel rats. We developed, this took us some time and a little bit of blood, we developed techniques to deal with these things. Uh, above all this meant sealing entrances, sealing exits, going in with flamethrowers, frankly, entombing or killing the people inside. And you were able to do this. In 1946 in Vietnam, the Viet Minh, as the resistance fighters were then called, began digging tunnels and underground bunkers to fight the French, who returned to Vietnam after World War II to reoccupy the former colony they called Indochina. In the spring of 1954, the Viet Minh defeated the French in the celebrated battle for Dien Bien Phu. It spelt the end for the French and their empirical aspirations. For the next 10 years, while the Army of South Vietnam, or ARVIN, and the Saigon government were mired in corruption and coups, 
the communist guerrillas now called Viet Cong or VC took control of rural South Vietnam. When they arrived in 1965, the U.S. armies, including the 1st and 25th Divisions, stepped into a bear trap. The enemy, battle-hardened communist guerrillas. <laughs> The Americans thought they could win the war easily. But in reality, it wasn't that simple. When we lost in combat, we did not take it as a loss. It gave us other presence and strength, which we would take into the next battle. From the hidden underground bunkers and spider holes, the Viet Cong guerrillas sprung devastating ambushes and stealthy night attacks that inflicted horrific casualties on American forces. You'd be walking through an area, and you really think there's going to be a bunker over here in this hedgerow, and there might be a sniper up in this tree and that kind of thing. But most of the danger came from walking through an area that was infested with tunnels and what we call spider holes, just small, you know, maybe just big around holes that these guys could pop up out of, take a shot. Here, guy in the back, pop back down. The young American and Allied soldiers on patrol in the thick jungle canopy of South Vietnam were left chasing shadows in an alien environment where violence and fear characterized their daily existence. You dreaded being in the jungle where you can't see. It was scary. There were times there were some jungle parts where even at 12 o'clock noon, you'd have to use a flashlight to see because it was that dark. Everybody was the same, everybody depended on each other, you know, uh, uh, sure, we got scared as hell sometimes, and, and sometimes you get so damn scared you couldn't move. To survive the horror of combat, soldiers quickly learned to suppress their emotions. On Operation Crimp, I think the first day there was four blokes killed, and I walked past their bodies and felt nothing, absolutely nothing. The Viet Cong became brilliantly adept at making savage booby traps. Some devices were brutally simple. When a trooper stepped onto one of these man traps, the wooden spikes impaled and incapacitated him. The guerrillas became especially skilled at turning unexploded American ordnance into devastating booby traps. Most of the time we found booby traps, it was because somebody, because somebody triggered it. Infantryman and soon-to-be tunnel rat Gary Schooler remembers vividly his first patrol in the Hobo Woods, just east of the Iron Triangle. This is the first time I saw anybody killed. My first day out, and some guy sat down. Uh, uh, we call them stick mines. It's a vertical bamboo stick. You can tilt it. You don't even have to step on. You can just tilt it, and it goes off. And then this horrible screaming. It's a real high shriek. It's just uh, ear piercing, and so you don't forget it. When you hear that sound, you don't forget it. You know the movie trap. In October 1965, 68 Australian engineers, or sappers, from 3 Field Troop arrived in Vietnam primarily to help locate and disarm the booby traps. However, they soon made a critical discovery that changed the course of the war. 25-year-old Captain Alex Sandy McGregor led the way. We came across this tunnel within a village, which was an enemy village. What happened was that I went down the tunnel, and I can remember my, my sergeant, um, uh, my staff sergeant, actually holding my legs um, with a rope, uh, so that I, because I went down head first. This first tunnel turned out to be a relatively short escape tunnel from a village hut. It would, however, be dwarfed by an incredible discovery on their next mission. The Australians were about to find the enemy's massive secret tunnel labyrinth, but their success would come at a deadly price. Many innovative weapons, including the Claymore mines, were introduced to combat during the Vietnam War. Among them were the F-4s, the AH-1G Huey Cobra, and the gunship. The tunnels of Vietnam will be right back. On January 7, 1966, American and Allied forces, under the direction of General William Westmoreland, launched a massive attack, spearheaded by the pride of America's military, the 1st Infantry. Division. The 
strike was aimed at the heart of the Viet Cong war machine in South Vietnam. They moved into the Ho Bo Woods, just east of the Iron Triangle. Helicopters, tanks, armored personnel carriers, and more than 8,000 men joined the battle. In one huge blow, America's leaders planned to find and destroy the Viet Cong Politico headquarters and effectively end the war. The Australian engineers of Three Field Troop were assigned to support the crack 173rd Airborne Brigade. They deployed from their base at Bien Hoa, just east of Saigon. The Australians headed for the south edge of the Ho Bo Woods. If all went according to plan, the enemy would be swept down towards them. Then the Australians would cut them off. But the plan backfired. The enemy was already waiting when they landed. As soon as we landed, I knew there was something up. There were shots coming out, there were, there were guns going off. We were being mortared at that time. The thing that no training will ever prepare you for is the sound. The sound and the smell. The noise is indescribable. And of course the other thing is that time really elongates itself and then things become very, very vivid whilst we are in action. In the midst of the chaos, an Australian infantryman spotted Viet Cong snipers firing from slits in what looked like an anthill. He crawled towards it and slung a grenade into the mound. He then called the engineers of Three Field Troop. The Aussie sappers were ready. They had already devised a technique to deal with the tunnels. They first blew the top off to reveal an entrance, and then they used an industrial air blower called a Mighty Mite and blew smoke down the hole. Then what we did was we blew down uh, tear gas. The smoke was to find entrances, the tear gas was to clear the tunnel of enemy as far as we could. And then our boys wearing gas masks, torch in one hand, bayonet in the other, going down the tunnel. The tunnel was empty. They then prepared explosives to destroy it. They skillfully placed the charges to make the maximum impact. The charges that were used were all big. Uh, military demolitions is like that. You make sure that the job's done properly the first time. So the charges were big. Less than a mile away, another tunnel had been found. Aussie sapper Ray Forrester and his partner were sent to investigate. I was scared the whole time. I won't even deny it. And inside it was, it was an eerie silence. You could kind of hear yourself breathing. Yeah, it was just, just very eerie. It was all slime and on the walls, whatever you touched was slimy and... And it just, just felt like <laughs> pigs to the slaughter, you know, because you're just rolling around the mud. While simple tunnels and underground bunkers had been found before, the ones discovered during Operation Crimp were on a massive scale never seen before. They found whole guerrilla encampments underground, bunkers connected by tiny passageways. There were chambers that stored arms and food. They had sleeping quarters and areas to treat the wounded. The tunnel rats found hidden trap doors laced with booby traps that led to even deeper levels and more chambers. They had uncovered the Viet Cong's secret underground fortifications. When General Westmoreland was informed of the find, he ordered all tunnels be searched for men, intelligence, arms and supplies. Then they were to be destroyed. The tunnel rats, driven by duty and courage, went to work. When they found trapdoors, they took even greater care in case it was armed with a booby trap. You'd use your fingers, you virtually went down and, and, and kissed it. That's how close you got, you know, just to make sure that, that you didn't miss anything. You can't miss anything, so you always just checked and double-checked. On day two of Operation Crimp, on January 8, 1966, three field troop returned to the Hobo Woods and parachuted into a hornet's nest. Incredibly, they landed on a VC tunnel. What they unearthed in it almost changed the course of the war. 
what we landed on was the headquarters of the Cholon Jardin area. We actually even pulled out the hit list, right, that the Viet Cong had of the senior officers in Saigon in the order that they were going to be hit. The VC hit list whetted their curiosity. The tunnel rats had unearthed a gold mine. They descended deeper, down three levels, but stopped before opening a trap door. Had they gone through that trap door, we would have unleashed hell because that was the only entrance into the heavy headquarters for the Saigon area. One trap door and we could have changed the whole war. Really, it's terrifying to know that there are that many people down below us. But also, um, I don't know what would have happened, to be quite honest with you. They only realized how close they were to the enemy headquarters after the war was over. Tragically, Operation Crimp also marked the first tunnel rat casualty. Corporal Bob Bartell got trapped in a small tunnel filled with smoke. Ray Forrester went down the tunnel to try and pull his friend out of the tunnel shaft. Oh, I must have gone in a few times. Um, I just couldn't move him, couldn't budge him. He was just stuck at the bottom of this, this trap door. I remember trying to dig out the, the tunnel entrance. But again, that was... That really wasn't satisfactory. Yeah, at, uh, I don't know at that stage. I guess later on he, he was dead, but I didn't know that at the time. I thought it was, I could try and get him out. When I finally had to give in, um, I went back up top. And... Um, Ray Forrester was unable to save his friend and reluctantly, following orders, returned to the surface. Sir. They realized that the smoke from the Mighty Might had sucked all the oxygen out of the tunnel, and Corporal Bartell suffocated to death. Operation Crimp was ended five days later, and American and Australian forces retreated. With the incredible discovery of a vast enemy underground network, however, more tunnel rats would be needed to risk their lives and volunteer for this deadly mission. Westmoreland requested an additional 206,000 troops at the height of the Tet Offensive in 1968. This top secret request was codenamed Operation Complete Victory. Modern Marvels will continue in a moment. January 1966. The 25th Tropic Lightning Infantry Division began to arrive in Vietnam. By the end of 1967, they would number 17,000 strong. Their mission was to eliminate the Viet Cong, destroy their subterranean stronghold, and protect Saigon. The 25th set up three camps, each bordering the treacherous Iron Triangle, Boi Loi, and Hobo Woods. The main base at Ku Chi gave them quick access to these danger zones. Strategic planners, however, soon realized that they had made a fatal error. The 25th began taking fire inside the Ku Chi base camp. We had three tunnels on the 25th Division's base camp. They were built before they arrived. When we attacked, they were taken by surprise. The 25th Infantry used earth movers called Rome plows and explosives to destroy the tunnels under the base. It took them months, but eventually they were satisfied that they had eliminated the threat from within. Military planners were now just beginning to realize the extent of the tunnel problem. Despite the best efforts of the tunnel rats, who destroyed dozens of enemy bunkers and tunnels, the Viet Cong expanded their system. By 1967, the tunnel network reached into Saigon itself. The apex of the complex was literally in the Saigon suburbs. You know, it would sort of been like if, if, if the Germans would have had a tunnel going into London in 1940. Incredibly, even the commander of all Viet Cong forces the leader of the resistance fighters in South Vietnam, Tran Bac Dang, would direct guerrilla operations by night and slip into Saigon and operate undetected during the day.
I live half my life in Saigon and half my life in the tunnels. My house was next door to the American ambassadors. On January 10, 1967, the 25th Infantry Division launched Operation Cedar Falls. The goal was to trap and crush the Viet Cong dug in and under the Iron Triangle. Newly recruited 25th Trooper C.W. Bowman arrived in Vietnam a few days before he went into the killing zone. When you were over there, you just had to recite to the fact that you were going to die. You know, you probably weren't going to make it, so you were going to do the best you could and fight as hard as you could. Patrol comrade Gary Heater was never too far from his close friend, Bowman. You know, I kind of want to get attached to somebody so I can have a friend over there, and I didn't want to get too friendly to too many people in case, you know, you get hurt or lose somebody. But he's the only one I ever got close to. Incoming troops were filled with tales of the horrors faced by a small band of men, the tunnel rats, who dared to chase the fierce Viet Cong down into their tunnels. Sometimes they would put right underneath the entrance, they'd put a, a man trap, a, a, a large punji pit. Instead of landing on, on solid ground, you'd land into a punji pit. Operation Cedar Falls marked the initiation of a new breed of tunnel rat. So many tunnels were being uncovered and no time to wait for engineers to search them. The petrifying task was now open to regular foot soldiers gutsy enough to volunteer. In our unit, you know, it was, hey, you know, we need somebody to go in the tunnel, and, and we went, you know, and you took a 45 and chambered around and cocked the hammer back and went in. Bowman and Heater volunteered for tunnel rat duty together. See, Debbie and I, we're closer than brothers, and I'd go in a lot of tunnels, and he'd come in behind me, or, I, or he'd go front. I felt safe when he was with me. That's, that's the big thing. Gary and I were, you know, we were just a couple old G.I. Joes, you know, and, and uh, looked at as, uh, I guess, a challenger or whatever, and uh, stepped up to uh, do it. During Operation Cedar Falls, Bowman and Heater were initiated in the terrifying hazards of tunnel rat duty. He pushed the trap door open and, and nothing happened, you know, so... Gary kind of stuck his arm up there with the light first and then just kind of eased up, looked over the edge and he dropped back down. He said, God, he says, there's a buoy trap up there, you know. And so what the hell's up there? He says, I don't know. He says, but it doesn't look good, you know. And, and uh, we looked back up there and, and Claymore was sitting up there on a, on a tripod. Luckily, the Claymore mine was not booby trapped and Bowman and Heater surfaced safely. Operation Cedar Falls ended in frustration and failure. Although some documents, weapons, and ammunition were recovered, the enemy was far from routed. The guerrillas quickly and secretively rebuilt the tunnels that were destroyed. 25th Infantry Tunnel Rats Bowman and Heater would soon return to action on new operations. Their biggest fear was meeting the enemy face to face. In the claustrophobic confines of the tunnel, the rats knew only one would emerge alive. Tunnel rat Gary Heater was shocked by his first underground encounter. It was turned out to be a three, four-year-old kid. This kid was just sitting there. I guess his dad just left him there. Maybe he heard me coming. But I just looked at him and he looked at me and you know, I had the flashlight on him. And I just kept on going. It scared me. He was just a kid, but it could have been daddy. The one time Bowman went in a tunnel by himself, he met the real enemy. He crawled through a long, narrow passageway that opened up to a large chamber, a recovery room, with VC gorillas lying in bunks. They had, like, their weapons up against the wall and stuff, and I kind of stumbled in there. When I came up in there and shined the light, you know, and boom, it was like, Keystone cops, they started reaching for the weapons and I started shoot. Flash, this happens, flash, that happens. Uh, people hollering, screaming, people shooting. Your heart's pounding. I mean, 
it's it's all reaction. You really don't think. You just start shooting. If you hesitate and think about it, you're the one that's probably going to die. I shot, you know, and uh, get the hell out of there as fast as I could. Bowman remarkably survived this terrifying face-to-face -face unscathed. Yet his tunnel rat buddy Gary Heater wouldn't be so lucky. On his last mission before flying home, he stepped on a landmine known as a bouncing Betty. I knew it was a bouncing Betty because I heard the spring. As soon as I stepped, we was running through this minefield. And it went off and... It didn't knock me unconscious. I was, I was awake until I got to the hospital. But I couldn't see my leg. Gary Heater fortunately survived, but spent two years in a veterans hospital before he could walk again. As 1967 closed, American military planners raised the stakes. B-52 arc light strikes increased in ferocity and breadth. U.S. planes dropped massive payloads of iron bombs and chemical defoliants that would eventually reduce the Iron Triangle and the Hobo Woods to a desolate moonscape. Into this maelstrom, a new crop of America's youth arrived to do battle. The bravest volunteered to be tunnel rats. In the dark depths, they fought for their nation, their honor, and their lives. During Operation Cedar Falls, an estimated 550 Viet Cong guerrillas were either killed or captured. The tunnels of Vietnam will continue in a moment. Frustrated with their inability to quell the dogged Viet Cong resistance, American military leaders raised the stakes and the heat. Toward the end of 1967, massive B-52, or arc light strikes, increased in South Vietnam. They pounded the Iron Triangle and the surrounding danger zones. On the ground, roam plows were liberally used to unearth and destroy tunnels. Chemical defoliants and napalm drops eliminated the jungle canopy used as cover by the enemy. Well, by the time all that was done, you defoliated thing, all these holes start popping up all over the place. And so there was just a lot more holes in our tunnel rats, I think. So they would uh, just say, well, anybody want to go down? And there was always a few of us that would. The tunnel rats found their own reasons to justify their dangerous mission. I enjoyed that mystique. Uh, I enjoyed that that whisper when when the new guys would come in and and they'd say, "That's Corey, you know, he's crazy." I hate to admit it, but I loved the rush. 25th infantryman and tunnel rat Art Tejeda turned the perilous task into a high stakes treasure hunt. Anything in that tunnel that belongs to you, aside that it going to as to intelligence, like maps and paperwork and stuff like that, but. You find uniforms, you find uh, weapons, you know, pistols, uh, bolt action rifles and stuff like that, which you can use for barter, which became pretty good. And it came to be a good uh, business. <laughs> the Viet Cong were ready as ever to repel interloping tunnel rats. They would tie uh, pit vipers and they would hang them upside down with their tails. So if you weren't aware of them, and you get in cl look close enough, you stick your head in one of them tunnels and bang. I saw one uh, one unfortunate young man who's, who was new. He didn't exactly know what he was doing. He crawled up. At least he knew enough to get down, but he crawled up to a tunnel and looked over the edge, and he was shot right in the face. The guy was just sitting there, right there. Tragic experience taught the rats to drop hand grenades into a tunnel entrance before they went in. The new rats adopted the now time-honored tools and techniques of the tunnel rat trailblazers. Other soldiers would hold me by my ankles and they put me head first. I'd go in there with a 45, my right hand, flashlight on my left. Once in the tunnel, the new rats were prey to the same heart-pounding trials and tribulations of their predecessors. 25th Infantryman Ken Corey volunteered to enter and search enemy tunnels. You were always listening to to hear if there were, you could, you could hear a pin being being pulled out of a grenade or.
hear a rifle being cocked. Infantryman Gary Schooler arrived in Vietnam in October 1967. Within days, he volunteered to be a tunnel rat. Memories of his rare duty would last a lifetime. There's one thing that will give me dreams, and I've had dreams about, and that is the thought of being buried alive, of, of uh, being trapped underground, not being able to get out, and your air slowly running out. And I, I never quite overcame that. Um, I have awoken in the middle of the night with, in a cold sweat thinking about that. During an underground search, Gary Schooler and his partner got lost in a deep and dark tunnel system. Forget the weapons. We don't care about the glory anymore. We just want to get out of there. Uh, you start thinking about what I, you know, could we be lost in here for a long time? Uh, or maybe never get out. Uh, finally, I mean, it seemed like we'd been down there three hours. Finally, saw a little shaft of light. We went to it, and it was a, it was a well. Pop out of the ground, and uh, it was in the middle of a clearing. It was just jungle on 360 degrees all around us. Gary Schooler and his partner made it out spooked, but safe. As a rule, however, once the tunnel had been searched and all intelligence and arms recovered, the tunnel rats had to go back down and destroy it. First, they would plant the C4 explosives in the most effective spots, then return to the surface to coordinate the demolition with the engineers detonating the charge. They said, are we ready? And said, yeah, okay. So I'd crawl back down the tunnel toward the end of the tunnel, and I'd pull the fuses. And this would start the cord. And as I'm crawling back, I'd be pulling fuses on every satchel. Once I got to the opening, they'd haul me out and we'd run like heck. And the ground would go up, the ground would go down. End of tunnel. Tragically, Art Tejeda lost his partner, John Riley, and nearly died himself in a terrifying tunnel search. Flashlight pointed down the tunnel and... Uh, there were three Viet VC there looking straight at us and uh, they opened up and the next thing I uh, saw was this green, yellow, red color flash, loud bang got my 45 and pointed down the tunnel and emptied out the clip I didn't hear anymore any more sounds or anything. I tried to get John, and he wasn't moving. And uh, I put my hand on his chest. His heart wasn't pounding or pumping anyway. He was dead. Art Tejeda was hit in the side. He was losing lots of blood and strength. And I could see my mother's face so lifelike. And she told me, I says, Art, you're hurt. Get out of that tunnel. I said, no, I'm tired. And she said, damn you, Art, get up and see the sun for one last time. So I started crawling out. And I was just so sleepy, so tired. I felt comfortable. Uh, I wasn't hurting. Consequently, I uh, saw a light and uh, got myself out of that tunnel. And... Uh, That was one of my uh, scariest days in Vietnam. Tunnel rats John Riley and Art Tejeda had been victims of an ominous buildup in Viet Cong tunnel activity. As 1968 arrived, tunnel rats found more and more stockpiles of arms and munitions. It was very common to find a cache with maybe 30, 40 weapons. Why were all these supplies? For what? There's nothing out there, you know? It's the Iron Triangle. It's, it's, it's a raised uh, it's a desert. It's a moonscape. What, what is all this stuff doing there? By the end of January 1968, the real reason for the huge arms caches and underground enemy encounters would be unveiled. The Viet Cong were about to deliver a stunning hammer blow on American and Arvin forces in every city in South Vietnam at once. It would forever be remembered as the Tet Offensive. Some tunnels were so deep, they were immune to the B-52 strikes. Close to half of the communist troops in the tunnel survived the attacks, while few survived on the outside. Modern Marvels will continue in a moment. 
On January 31st, 1968, the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese Army launched the Tet Offensive. In one single massive blow, they hit every major city in South Vietnam at the same time. The communists believed the South Vietnamese Army would crumble and the people in the cities would rise up and join them. The formidable 9th Viet Cong Division, the guerrillas who built and fought so tenaciously from the tunnels around Cu Chi, were joined by units of the NVA and attacked Saigon. The true reason for the huge caches of arms and supplies uncovered by the tunnel rats had been revealed. January 31st, when the Tet Offensive hit, it all became clear because that was a staging area. The troops moved in there and something like two or three days into the, through the tunnels. They picked up their weapons, they, all their gear, and all this ammunition stuff they've been stockpiled. The undefeated 9th Viet Cong Division and units of the North Vietnamese Army sprang from the tunnels and attacked Saigon. They were led by Vietnamese war hero Tran Bac Dang. The tunnels served as the staging area. We launched the Tet Offensive from there. America's 1st and 25th Divisions and the South Vietnamese Army, after years of frustrating guerrilla warfare, swiftly engaged the enemy. The morale in most American combat units actually went up. Here you've got an objective. The enemy is there. They're out there. They're fighting. 26 days later, the attack on Saigon and South Vietnam was repelled. Thousands of Viet Cong and NVA were killed, and the 9th Viet Cong Division was completely decimated. Tens of thousands are thought to have died. The Tet Offensive had failed for the Viet Cong in its military objectives. In the wake of Tet, American military leaders redoubled their attacks. B-52 bomb strikes aimed directly on the Iron Triangle and the underground fortifications increased in ferocity. The first thing you would see is these flashes, but no sound. And then you feel the, uh, the rumble of the ground. The ground starts rumbling like an earthquake. Then the next thing, the last thing, is the sound finally gets to you. In my opinion, the sound of the bombs falling was more frightening than the sound of the explosion. The bombs exploding two kilometers away was the most dangerous. The air pressure and where it caused was so strong would bury people try to escape from the tunnel. I fought many American soldiers, not only in Kuchi, but in many places, face to face. I'm not sure how I survived. Perhaps it was the will of God. <laughs> the few Viet Cong fighters that survived the Tet Offensive and the B-52 strikes soon abandoned the tunnels. Instead of 20 men, 20 man cells uh, protecting a certain part of the tunnel complex they were down to two or three men and uh, that was kind of the beginning of the end for the tunnels there weren't enough people to, to fix the damage the Viet Cong began to pull back from the Iron Triangle and Hobo Woods toward Cambodia and the north some guerrilla cells retreated into caves secreted in the Black Lady Mountain Despite the best efforts of the rats sent to destroy the Viet Cong mountain fortification, the guerrillas and NVA fighters held the mountain for the duration of the war. We had the top, we had the bottom, we had the middle. But it was impenetrable. It was one of those impenetrable fortresses, and, and we never did, we never could drive them out of there. It was a safe haven for them. In 1968, 14,000 American troops died in South Vietnam. It was the worst year for casualties on all sides. While accurate statistics are not available, some experts estimate dozens of infantrymen lost their lives on tunnel rat missions. For the dutiful line soldiers and courageous tunnel rats who survived, the flight home was a victory. Oh, going home. The Freedom Bird. That's what we used to call that last flight out of out country. And you can imagine, you're out here with a rifle, 
You're sloshing in a stupid rice paddy. You got all this stench. You got the bugs. And here you're looking at a plane, you say, gee, I hope it's my turn next. <laughs> Today, statues of revolutionary leader Ho Chi Minh stand in the streets of Saigon. The bustling former capital of South Vietnam is now District 1 of the newly named Ho Chi Minh City. Only 40 miles north lay the tunnels of Ku Chi. They are now open to the public as a war memorial, administered by veteran Viet Cong guerrillas. As American soldiers searched above, the Viet Cong hit below. We had tunnels right here. The tunnels of Ku Chi, the underground fortification that was at the heart of the Viet Cong victory, is celebrated as a national monument, as significant as Boston is to the American Revolution. Ku Chi served not only as a battlefront, but a symbol of self-determination. It gave the Vietnamese people courage to fight the American soldiers. Colonel Chow Lam was an artillery officer with the 9th Viet Cong Division and fought from these underground bunkers. Đây là con đường, cái cửa hầm để xuống tham quan cái. This is a fighting post. In the over 250 kilometers of tunnel, there were thousands of these fighting posts. Adventurous visitors are free to explore the Viet Cong's once secret underground bunkers and tunnels. This is a trap door. Even if they found it, it was armed with a booby trap. If American soldiers tried to open it, it would explode. It could only be opened from the inside. Anyone who tries to open it from the outside would be killed in the explosion. Also on display, a grisly array of simple booby traps. Cleverly crafted and cunningly placed, these contraptions were designed to maim. The horrifically wounded troopers would require help, medics and helicopters. A whole company could be tied up and be vulnerable to attack. The stunning simplicity of these booby traps is a grim reminder of the brutality of war. This is where we brought injured soldiers after they had been administered surgery. The Kuti fighters were treated here, and our doctors and nurses saved many lives in a very difficult situation. In the nightmare that was the Vietnam War, the troops in the combat zone distinguished themselves with their commitment to duty, honor, and country. The tunnel rats of America's fighting forces, including the 1st and 25th Divisions, and Australia's three-field troop, showed uncommon valor and nerves of steel as they dared to chase the enemy down into the dreadful dark passageways. They recovered intelligence and arms that stemmed the tide of enemy insurgents and helped save lives. In the black, petrifying passageways, the tunnel rats disarmed lethal booby traps and met the enemy face to face. The lucky and quick lived to tell the tale. It's just the idea that you can overcome that, that fear. There's nothing like going through that kind of thing and winning. Uh, I mean, bad things can happen to you, but if you come out ahead, um, you got something to be proud of, I think. I really enjoyed the minute I got out. <laughs> you know, that was the best. That was the best part of the mission was was getting out of that hole. I didn't consider myself a hero or anything like that. You know, I was just a, a grunt like the rest of them. You know, I've always, you know, the guys that didn't make it and stuff. You know, they were the heroes. We were just GI Joes. You know, doing our job. The History Channel proudly offers the program you're watching on home video for only $24.95 plus shipping and handling. To order, call 1-800-708-1776 or shop online at HistoryChannel.com. Our president was gone. 
generals were in rebellion. In 30 days, we would cease to exist as a nation. But a handshake and one man's word changed history forever. It wasn't a month. It was a miracle. April 1865. April 14th at 9. Only on the History Channel.